Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's so good to be here. I was here uh, last year for GIDS, and so when I was invited back so kindly, I jumped at the opportunity. This is one of my favorite conferences to speak in, quite literally worldwide. So thank you once again for, for joining me here today. Uh, I run a company called uh, Thirsty Head, and uh, the focus for the last oh, five years or so has been on Groovy and Grails advocacy. Um, you'll hear me talking about Groovy and Grails uh, uh, tomorrow in the Java conference. But within the past year or so, I've also been focusing on a different set of technologies. Not just Groovy and Grails, but also HTML5. So today, you'll hear me talking about HTML5, and then later in the same room, you'll hear me talking about uh, microformats, uh, RDFA and microformats. But before we get started with this, we have a very important question to pose for you. Um, I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Venkat Subramaniam. He'll be presenting after me today. He was here yesterday speaking at .NET, and I was out shopping. And I bought a brand new shirt. Do you like my shirt? Yes, yes very much. Venkat begged me not to wear it today. He begged me. He says, please, please, please do not wear it. He said, if I wear it, I'll be hearing words like this all day. Which I can only imagine means esteemed scholar, wise man. Is that what these mean? No, they don't? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Well, we argued back and forth, and then the fortune that, that we had, the thought for the day at breakfast, convinced me that indeed I am going to wear this shirt. Of course, I had to scratch it out a little bit and insert my own words, but um, I'm very happy with my shirt. I hope you enjoy it as well. If you come back tomorrow, you'll get a chance to see the sari that I bought as well. Yeah? <laughs> Okay, enough of this nonsense. We're here to talk about HTML5 today. So let me ask you a silly question. How many of you in here know HTML? Show of hands, please. A ridiculous question, isn't it? Of course we all know HTML. We are web developers. So let me ask you this, another show of hands. How many of you have ever had any formal training in HTML? Look around. Look around. No hands, very few hands go up. Amazing, isn't it, that we are expected to be experts in a technology when we've had no formal training? Many times the idea is, oh, HTML is too easy. You don't need any formal training. But without sitting down and understanding the technology, sometimes you can miss some of the nuance of what's going on. So I'm hoping that today will be your first training in HTML5 because there are a lot of new exciting features that you might not be aware of. And if you continued programming like you have in years past, you would miss all of the excitement and all of the new features that are coming in HTML5. So what we're going to talk about today at a very high level are just some of the new elements that are available to you. Some of the structural elements like header and footer and nav. We're going to talk about some of the new form fields that are available to you. We'll talk briefly about mobile development. The support for mobile development in HTML5 is outstanding. And then we'll touch briefly on video at the end of the talk. Now, I'm going to be doing very little coding. I will be doing no coding here. But if you stay and hear my colleague uh, Venkat's presentation next, his talk is going to expand on what we've talked about here, and he's going to give you live demonstrations of many of the features we talk about today. So consider this an introduction to the features, and then afterwards, Dr. Venkat Subramaniam's presentation will be on the implementation and demonstration of these features. So before you get lost in a sea of all of the new tags that are available and all the new features and APIs, I want you to be aware that the biggest new feature of HTML5 is the semantic element in here. And I'm not talking about capital S semantics with griddle and, and owl and all of those kinds of things. I'm not talking about a formal ontology. That's, that's good stuff as well. But I'm talking about a lowercase s semantics. The tags now mean something, mean something very important. For example, this is what your typical web page might look like. And I know this might be hard, but there are divs 
with IDs. You have a div ID equals header, div ID equals nav, div ID equals footer, things like that. Right? This is state-of-the-art web development right now. There's nothing wrong with this. This has continued to be supported even in HTML5. Divs are a division of HTML code, and the ID allows to give you a semantic name to it. So I can look at this div and say, oh, this clearly is my header. This clearly is my nav section. But this is HTML5. What the W3C has done is it's provided a new set of elements for header, for nav, for footer, for section, for article, these kinds of things. Now it's very interesting, as Java developers, we wait for the spec to come first. We wait for Java 1.7 to be released. Are you waiting for Java 1.7 to be released? I'll be a very old man by the time Java 1.7 is released. But once it's released, we know that it's fully implemented. We know that we'll be able to program to that spec. In HTML, the reverse is the case. The browser vendors and manufacturers start implementing these features and then the World Wide Web Consortium codifies what they've done. So when they saw what was going on in HTML4, they said, aha, we're seeing some common patterns. Literally in the specification, they say we are paving over the cow paths. We're paving over the cow paths. We're paving over the way people have normally done these kinds of things and codified it with a new set of elements. Does that make sense? And what's especially interesting about this now is if you're interested in screen readers or support for uh, uh, vision impaired users, if you just simply say div ID equals nav, sometimes it'll be nav, sometimes it'll be navigation, sometimes it'll be sitemap, there's no way for screen readers and things to bypass that. And so typically what you do is you put your navigation at the bottom of the screen and use CSS to move it back up. So when the screen reader is reading the source, it doesn't read the navigation information over and over again. Now, with the new semantic elements, nav means something. And screen readers and other applications can go in and parse that code and do interesting things with it. Whether it's ignore the code for a screen reader or provide a new set of information for whatever app happens to be reading this. Does that make sense? This is what we're talking about. This is why semantics are so exciting about HTML5. Let me ask you for one more show of hands here. Are any of you using HTML5 in your applications right now? Oh, very good. A few hands go up. A few hands go up. Are you the same people who had formal training in HTML? Perhaps. Perhaps. So let me tell you right now, I don't recommend you use HTML, HTML5 because it's, it's very new. It's very experimental. No one is using it. Oh. Oh, wait. No, Google is using it. Google is using it. If you go to Google.com, now I did not have a chance to check Google.in, so we'll have to see that. If someone would, would go and do a, a view source on that, but if you go to Google.com in the United States and do a view source, you'll see this doc type, doc type HTML. This means that they're using HTML5. It must be ready for prime time if they're using it in their main portal as everyone comes in. So Google is an interesting case because not only are they using HTML5 on their website, they also, of course, have Google Chrome as well. How many of you use Google Chrome? Yeah, oh, a lot of hands go up. It's a wonderful browser, isn't it? Very fast, very standards compliant. So when we say Google bets big on HTML5, we mean that not only are they providing outstanding support for it in the browser, but they are using the technology. They're eating their own dog food. They're making sure that HTML5 is not only being used by other websites, but it is easily consumed by their browsers as well. Apple is all in on HTML5. If you go to apple.com and do a view source, they're using doctype HTML. They're using HTML5 for all their websites, and of course Safari is an outstanding browser with incredible support for HTML5 as well. If we go to mozilla.org, Mozilla.org is using HTML5 on their main page, and Firefox has wonderful HTML5 support. The list goes on and on, don't you? Do you see a pattern developing here? Even Opera, how many of you use Opera out here? Oh, I love that little browser, don't you? It's incredibly fast. It's incredibly fast, yes. Opera has wonderful support. Uh, unfortunately, if you do a view source 
on opera.com, they're not using HTML5 yet. So if you know anyone on Opera, would you send them a letter? Let them know that it really hurts my presentation, that they're not using HTML5? They will. They will soon enough. So there we've covered all the major browsers, haven't we? I can't think of another one. Google Chrome, <laughs> Safari, Firefox, Opera. All of the major browsers are covered in HTML5. <laughs> what? No, did I forget something? Oh, yes, I must have forgotten something. Yes. Believe it or not, even IE9 has HTML5 support in it. Very nice support. If you've been in the business for a while like I have, you remember the bad old days, don't you? When Microsoft was running as fast as they could in one direction, and Netscape Navigator was running as fast as it could in the other direction. Netscape would create some new tags, and Microsoft would say, I'll take those tags and build more. And then they'd say, oh, well, we'll take the Microsoft tags, and we'll build more this way. They're running as fast as they could apart from each other. It made our jobs very hard. Now, all of the major browsers are running as fast as they can to converge on a single point. All of the major browser manufacturers are trying to claim that we have the best support for HTML5, and we have the quickest support for HTML5. We're the fastest to implement all the features, or we're the most fully featured HTML5 compliant browser. It's amazing, isn't it, that now, almost 20 years later, everyone is competing on how well they implement the spec instead of how divergent they can make their technology. But that's just the desktop browsers. Certainly, the desktop browser market is very important. Ah, but what about mobile phones? I have my beloved iPhone here. Yeah? What we find is many of the new features in HTML5 are not just valuable for mobile development. They can be applied to desktop development as well. But HTML5 is especially interested if you're targeting mobile development. So much so that my consultancy right now, Thirsty Head, is focusing on working with clients saying, no, don't go off and write one application in Objective-C and try to sell it through the, Apple, uh, the App Store and then go off and write another application in Java and try to sell it through the Android Store. Why not use HTML5 on the mobile platform so you have something that will write once, run anywhere? Not Java in this case, but HTML5. And you see many companies doing this from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal to USA Today, all of the major network television channels in the United States, ABC, NBC, CBS, all of these websites, are, excuse me, all of these mobile applications are simply HTML5 wrapped with a thin facade, enough of an application to get them into the App Store or the Android Store or the Amazon Store or anything like that. We're finding that HTML5 is that unifying technology. Uh, Douglas Crockford, who is who's a very popular in the, in the JavaScript space, if you work with Jason, you recognize his name. He says that JavaScript finally is the right once run anywhere programming language because that's the one that's supported across all the browsers. So here are some interesting numbers for you when it comes to mobile support. Now, what we see here is November 2010. That's the latest value where these, where these stats are available to us. But we see this is market share for Research in Motion. I'm very excited to see the new playbook, the new RIM uh, uh, tablet. That looks very interesting. Outstanding HTML5 support, by the way. We see what Apple's market share is. Microsoft's market share. Now, this is in the mobile market, isn't it? Whereas Windows has an overwhelming majority in the desktop, they have a vanishingly small percentage of the mobile platform. Palm and Google. But what's especially interesting about this is if we look at RIM and Apple and Palm and Google, all of these mobile devices, something that makes up close to 90% of the market, these are all mobile browsers that have HTML5 support in them. Windows Phone will get that in a very quick release, but they currently don't have the support in it right now. But what I think is even more interesting is not just hardware in pocket, but when we look at usage patterns. This big part of the pie right here is iPhone users. This is mobile sites 
when they say how many, what, what platform, what browser are you using? Over 50%, 55% of them are using the iPhone, another 25, uh, 20 percent of them are using the Android. A full 75 percent of the market are using HTML5 compliant browsers. This very small four percent slice right here is the Windows market. So HTML5 is definitely something that you should be targeting for your desktop developers. There's no reason not to. But if you're doing mobile development, I can't imagine why you wouldn't be using HTML5. Let me leave you with one more idea. Have you heard of the O'Reilly curve before? Have you heard this phrase? Yes. So there's a phrase here, and I know the text is small. Don't worry about it. The idea is what's important. That in this chart, the cost to implement a technology is very, very high over time relatively. Very early in the stage of a technology, it's very expensive to implement that. Whereas over time, it's almost free to implement that technology. You knew this already. And then what Doug Kay did is overlaid the value curve on top of it. He says when there are very few people using this technology, it's very low value. But over time, the more people who use it, it becomes incredibly valuable to have support for this technology. And he says here is where it's interesting. Conventional wisdom would be that you need to start paying attention to this technology where the two curves cross, where the cost curve and the value curve cross. He says actually, no, that's too late. If you wait for that convergence, it's too late. You need to back it up. You need to not wait for final standards. You not need to wait for the uh, availability of, of technical staff. When you need to start paying attention to a particular technology is when the first O'Reilly book is released on that technology. <laughs> that is the O'Reilly curve right there. If you're looking at a technology and you go to Amazon or go to a bookstore and you begin seeing one or two or three or a dozen books on a technology, you re realize that it's here, it's ready to be used. If you go to a bookstore and don't see any books on the technology, they say, wait and see, wait and see, maybe next year. So there's an O'Reilly book that was released very late last year, Q4 of last year. There's also a Pragmatic Press book. There's also a Manning book. There's also an A-Press book. There are a number of books out there in HTML5, and all of them came out very late last year. So this is the O'Reilly Curve in action. This is when we need to be, begin paying attention to this technology. We need to be implementing it now, not taking a wait-and-see moment, because if you wait and see, you'll be too late. Yeah? Yeah. Well, this is an outstanding book. What I like most about it is that it's available for free, entirely for free, online. If you go to diveintohtml5.org, diveintohtml5.org, you can get the entire contents of this book for free. O'Reilly's been doing that a lot with their books recently when they're based on open standards technology and open source technology. Diveintohtml5.org. And you can begin reading more about HTML5. Mark Pilgrim's a wonderful author. I'm a big fan of his work. So, let's start looking at what this means. Let's start looking at the new elements. First of all, you've seen this new doc type. Do you miss the old doc type? Oh, my goodness. How many different doc types were there? Where there was strict and there was transitional and there was frame set and there was XHTML and there was HTML. There are all kinds of different things. So we're in our third decade of HTML development. If you can believe it, Tim Berners-Lee began working on it in the late 80s, early 90s. For the first 10 years of HTML, HTML was like SGML. SGML was the, the inspiration for HTML. So for 10 years, we said, oh, yeah, HTML is kind of like SGML, but not really. It's like it, but not exactly. Yeah. The next 10 years, we spent saying HTML is just like XML. Not exactly, but HTML is just like XML, inspired by XML, similar to XML. That's where the XHTML standard came up. The W3C has officially dissolved the XHTML committee. XHTML is deprecated. What that means, of course, we'll continue to support it. But they said in this third decade of HTML, HTML is not like 
SGML, XML, or HTML is not like XML. HTML is like HTML. Finally, we've gotten there. And so this radical simplification of the doc type means that now, this is just an HTML document, and we should treat it as such. Now, some programmers get concerned about that. They say, well, wait a second. What happens when HTML 5.1 comes out? What about HTML 5.2 service pack 3? Huh? What are we going to do then? Huh? And the W3C says, no, 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 no. That's not how this game works. Browsers, believe it or not, are already forward compatible. They said, whatever the version of HTML is, HTML 12, when that comes out, they said, this doc type will be able to support it because the way browsers are engineered, they are able to be forward compatible. Let's talk about what that means. We have new elements being introduced, like header and footer and nav and section and article. This is not a complete list, but these are the, the big ones, the most popular ones you'll begin using right away. These are the ones you'll, you'll see in Dr. Subramaniam's talk in just a moment. Most browsers, if you give them a tag they don't recognize, will continue to display the information. They said, we don't understand the semantics of header and footer, but we'll go ahead and display the information. You can do that in your development right now. If you create a tag called Scott and another tag called Davis, your browsers will display the information. It won't do anything special with it, but they will display the information. Now, if you want to add a little bit of semantics to it, one of the things you can do is you can add a little CSS. This is a recommended practice. These are all the new elements, article, aside, canvas, details, fig caption, figure, so on and so forth. And when you do CSS, you're saying these should be treated as block-level elements. We know block-level elements, don't we? Things like P, the paragraph tag, a block-level element means there's an implicit carriage return new line after them. So H1 is a block-level attribute. P is an H-level attribute. Div is a block-level attribute. Yeah? The other type of attributes are spans. There are things that don't have the new line after them. So if you say B for bold or I or italic or anchor href, there's no implicit carriage return after those tags. And so in CSS, we can just say, hey, all these new HTML5 tags, these should be treated as block level tags. And if you include this CSS in your page, you have made every browser on the planet, <clears throat> with one important exception, HTML5 aware. This is exactly what Google and Apple and Mozilla are doing. They're saying, here are these new tags you may not understand. Please treat them as a block tag. Oh, poor Internet Explorer. So they took exactly the opposite approach, as Microsoft is wont to do. IE says, if you give me a tag that I don't recognize, I'm not going to just ignore it. I'm going to hide all the content in the body of that tag. So your users won't be able to see it either. If I don't understand it, they don't get to see it. <laughs> Too bad. That was fixed in IE9. IE9 does the right thing now. But all previous versions of IE, if it didn't understand the element, it would hide the information. And so folks have come up with a really nice workaround. They said in JavaScript, if you go in and programmatically create that DOM element, header and footer and so on and so forth, then IE will recognize it. And then IE will display the information. So what they've come up with is this idea of an HTML5 shiv. If you include this little hunk of code at the top of your page, if Internet Explorer then include this HTML shiv, all that shiv is doing is using JavaScript to programmatically create all the new HTML5 elements. And if you don't want to include that shiv for any reason, here is that shiv in its entirety. Much like we did with CSS, it's simply iterating through all of the new elements and calling document create element on it. So between the CSS I showed you before and this shiv for IE, now every browser on the planet, including IE, is HTML5 compatible. This is why Google is comfortable using it on their home page. This is why Apple is comfortable using it on their page and Mozilla and Opera soon enough that all of these folks have said, now we can make these browsers recognize what it means to be HTML5 compliant. So those are structural tags. 
header, footer, nav section article. Let's drill in now on form elements because there are a lot of new form elements. It's hard to believe that this is what has been state of the art since the early 90s. There hasn't been a new form element added. This is why we reach out to the YUI toolkit or Dojo or Moo tools or any of these other JavaScript libraries. We want to synthesize new elements, new form elements. Well, HTML5 brings a number of new form elements. All of these are input type equals something. Input type equals text, of course. Input type equals radio, certainly. But input type equals telephone. Input type equals search. Input type equals URL or email. Now, remember how I started this talk. The browser will not do anything with this. If you say input type equals search, it will not auto-wire that field up to Google or to Bing or to any of the other search engines. You semantically identify that field as a search field. Some browsers will give you slightly different behavior. If you create um, uh, a, um, uh, a number, excuse me, or a range, Input type equals range. It'll give you a slider bar as you go along. Some browsers will, not all of them will. But remember, the important thing about HTML5 is semantics. And Mark Pilgrim says this as much in his book. He says, I started to write a sentence that said, in browsers that don't support the email form type. But then he had to pause. Because every browser on the planet, including IE, supports these new form elements. Any browser that doesn't understand an input type equals something will revert back to type equals text. So there is zero downside in using any of these new form elements. Zero downside. Because every browser, again, try it. Create an input type equals shoe size. Yes? Input type equals favorite food. You can do that kind of stuff. Your browser will present you with a text field, but you will now have additional semantics on those form fields. And on the desktop, there's no danger in using these. But in the mobile browser, oh boy. Have you noticed that on these mobile devices, they have soft keyboards or virtual keyboards? And so if you say input type equals email, on the iPhone, it will give you the magic dot com button. I love the dot com button. I wish my computer had a dot com button on it, a physical button that had dot com on it. Yeah? But what it'll do is if you give it input type equals number, it'll give you a keyboard that just offers numbers. If you give it type equals URL, it'll give you a soft keyboard that is appropriate for that data type. Input type equals email, and on and on. So while there is zero downside in using it on the desktop, there is nothing but upside in using this for mobile devices because they will begin displaying custom keyboards appropriate to the data type. This is an example of what some of these elements would look like in Opera. Interestingly enough, Opera is the furthest among all of the browsers in terms of giving you custom widgets to look at. And again, this is what the HTML will look like. I'm not trying to put Venkat on the spot. I don't know. Are you, are you going to talk about some of the custom form elements here? Yes. Excellent. So you'll see some more of this in practice. So you say input type equals number with a min and a max and a step and a value. You can say input type equals search. You can say these kinds of things. Now what happens if you want to begin checking for the existence, the browser support of these new kinds of elements? There's a library out there called Modernizer. Modernizer. If you go to modernizer.com, you can include this. And what this library allows you to do is very small. I believe it's no more than about 7K compressed and minified. But what you can do is include it at the top of this page. And this library allows you to check for the existence of all these new HTML5 form elements. So we're able to go in right now and we're able to say if the input type date is supported, then go off and do these things. Now, in fact, what you'd normally do is say, if it's not supported, then allow me to polyfill new support. This is a new word you'll hear HTML5 developers use, polyfill. It's a portmandu. It's a, it's a combination of two words. Polymorphically backfill this behavior in for browsers who don't have the support. 
The state of the art in web development used to be to program to the weakest animal in the herd, the slowest, the more sickly. I won't mention it by name, but you know which browser I'm talking about. Everyone says, oh, well, we will program to IE. Oh, I did it, didn't I? We'll program to what IE can do. And then all the other browsers, of course, will support the bare minimum what IE does. We're not doing that anymore. Now, with HTML5, we said no. That holds us back. That slows down progress. What we want to do is program to the most frontmost animal in the herd, the strongest, the fastest animal in the herd. And for the slower animals, we will polyfill support. We will polymorphically backfill support back in. So eventually, they will grow up big and strong, and they will be grown up animals as well. So Modernizer is a library that allows you to detect if a feature isn't available, then provide your own alternate technology. There's a great website called findmebyip.com. Find me by IP. And if you visit this website, it does user agent detection so you can see exactly what browser you're in. But more importantly, it gives you tables that say, ah, this feature is supported by this browser, this feature is not. This feature is, this feature is not. Findmebyip.com is using Modernizer under the covers. But you can go there and visit it in your browser and tell at a glance, oh, I support rounded corners. I support drop shadows. I support these new elements, or I don't. Very good website for you. Let's talk about mobile support. I didn't ask you earlier, so let me ask you now. How many of you are doing any kind of mobile support? Any mobile browser development? Some of you, very, very few hands. You're shy. It's OK. Raise them high. Be proud. Did you know that in Q4 of last year, in fourth quarter of last year, it was the first time that smartphones outsold computers in history? There were more smartphones sold than computers. Tablets, the iPad, had literally been around one year. In one year, outsold all netbooks in the same category. We are very definitely in an age where mobile development is important for you as a web developer. You can't ignore it anymore. We need to make sure that we support our Androids and our iPhones and our iPads and our Motorola uh, our playbooks and our, excuse me, our RIM playbooks and our Motorola Zooms and our, our, our uh, 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 Samsung Galaxy tabs and all of these kinds of things. Now tablets generally have a large enough screen real estate that you can kind of get by with not providing a customized user experience. But certainly with mobile devices, we need to be able to target those things. And HTML5, as I said, has a number of features that are fine for the desktop, but really interesting for mobile devices. Because what we're in now is an idea where we can begin bringing the web with us. We can begin taking our information with us. I, I travel so much, I use an application called TripIt.com, where I keep track of all my hotel reservations and airline reservations, all those kinds of things. The idea that sometimes you're connected on a mobile phone and sometimes you're not, but still want to bring the data along with you is unheard of for desktop browsers. But it's a reality for mobile browsers. So another website called HTML5 Rocks. HTML5rocks.com has a number of very good tutorials, a number of good places where you can go see the code implemented. And they talk about two very important technologies for mobile devices, app cache, application cache, and local storage. We'll touch briefly on both of them, app cache and local storage. App cache is a way for you to explicitly cache all of your HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images. It's a way that you can say to your mobile device, even when you're offline, even when you're in airplane mode, I want you to make sure that this HTML, CSS, JavaScript is available to you. So you can begin running your web applications without the web. Yeah. The way you do it is very simply. You add a manifest attribute to HTML. So your head element HTML, you add a manifest entry. And this manifest entry is very simple. If you do nothing else, if you just begin listing out the items that you want, the resources that you want, those things will be cached and available to you even when your mobile phone is offline. But it gets better. 
because you can go in and explicitly cache certain resources like they're doing here. Index, my style sheet, images, scripts. There's a section called cache. There's a section called network. And the resources that you place under network are required for the browser to be online. So in this case, we're saying, oh, in order to get to login.php, in order to get to anything under slash my API, shoot for anything at api.twitter.com, you must be online in order to access these resources. And your browser will gently warn you. As you click on one of those buttons or try to access the resources, it'll pop a dialog saying, I'm sorry, you must be online to consume this resource. So we have cached, we have network, and my favorite of the bunch is fallback. Because fallback allows you to gracefully degrade. So fallback is a way for you to say when you're online, you'll have these resources available to you. But if you're offline, please display these resources instead. So in a cache, anything under the images large directory, if you're online, you'll be able to see all those images in image large. If you're offline, it'll display offline.jpg in its stead. So what this means is you could conceivably write a Twitter client in HTML5. So when you're online, you're reading the tweets that are coming in, you're adding tweets, you're doing these kinds of things. When you flip into airplane mode, you'd be continue to f type in those tweets, but they'd have to be saved somewhere because you aren't connected to the network. They have to be saved somewhere, and then when you reconnect to the network, they would be sent up to Twitter all at once. So whereas app cache is for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, images, resources. Local storage is for data. Now you'll see that there are lots of things you can do with app cache. There's a whole life cycle you can go through. App cache can be in uncache mode or checking or downloading or update ready or obsolete. You can programmatically go in through JavaScript and say I want to update the cache or swap the cache, all of those kinds of things. So you have full control of this cache through JavaScript as well. But let's talk about that other thing. App cache is for resources. Local storage is for data. Now when it comes to data, what we find is that it has got across the board support. Yes, you see that right. Even IE8 and above supports local data. This is an HTML5 feature that has universal support. And it allows you to treat data simply as a hash map. You go in and you say local storage this key equals this value, local storage this key equals that value, and so on and so forth. This is like cookies, right? Except completely different. Because cookies were limited to 4K, cookies were transported back and forth to the server each time. It was a pretty terrible persistence mechanism, as a matter of fact. Local data does none of that. All this data is kept locally. You have up to 5 meg of data available to you. I've heard just recently the iPhone devices, the iOS devices, up to that status to 30 megabytes. So you have a lot of storage for keeping these kinds of things. Even within 5 meg, you can imagine Twitter.com being able to capture a couple of tweets, store them long enough for me to get back online, and then transmit them. Like cookies, this is 5 meg per domain, per URL. But it's no SQL. It's a big hash map in the sky, except it's not in the sky. It's in the midst of your browser. I'm going to be talking about CouchDB tomorrow. Yeah, I'm sure you'll get a lot of talks about NoSQL type devices, schemaless devices. They all work the same way. And now in every browser across the board, you have a NoSQL persistent solution available to you. Now what's interesting is there is another standard out there called WebSQL, the WebSQL database support. It is supported across all of the WebKit browsers. So it is supported in Safari, it's supported in Chrome, it's supported in Android and, and iPhone. But it's not supported in Mozilla, and it's not supported in IE, and as a matter of fact, it never will be. Both organizations have said very clearly they have no intention of supporting this aspect of HTML5. The Mozilla organization had the most interesting approach. They said, it offends our delicate sense of aesthetics. 
It offends us. We don't think it's an elegant technological solution. You know, so they said we have no plan of implementing a SQL database inside of your browser. So you can do this kind of stuff if you're specifically targeting an Android device. If you're specifically targeting Safari or Chrome or any of the WebKit browsers, please continue to use these things. But realize if you're looking for something that is truly right once run anywhere, something that will run across all browsers, you should be looking at the NoSQL solution, local storage, not a traditional SQL solution. Yeah? All right. The last thing we have to talk about here is video. And what's interesting is this is what people get most excited about. When people hear about HTML5, the thing that they hear most is, oh, wait for this new video support. It's interesting because when you actually look at it, it's a bit underwhelming, isn't it? It looks just like image source, doesn't it? We've been doing this all along, image source. But yes, now we can do video source. As a matter of fact, you can do audio source as well. Yeah? Now the problem with video is there is no one single video format, container and codec, that you can use that will work across all browsers. Now with images, we don't think twice. We'll say image source equals scott.jpg. And we'll say image source equals vencat.ping. And we'll say uh, image source equals uh, uh, tim.gif. Right? I mean, we've got a bunch of different image formats floating around. So it's not the fact that there are multiple formats that's the problem. We're lucky that all the major browsers support all the major codecs right now for images. So we can use them across all browsers. The W3C recognized this. And when they were creating the new video tag, they said, this will be the simple form of it, but you'll also be able to use an expanded form of this video tag as well. So you'll be able to have a block level tag video, and inside of it, you'll be able to specify source, 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 source as you go along. And the browser will start at the top of the list, and it'll read them sequentially. So if it can understand the first video format it finds, it'll begin playing that. If it doesn't understand that, it'll move to the next. If it doesn't understand, it'll move to the next. Mark Pilgrim's book, Dive into HTML5, has wonderful descriptions of all the different codecs and exactly which is supported by which browser. But at the end of the day, he says you can do something like this. And I know it's small to read. Don't worry about that. The idea here is that you can have a video tag. And you can provide access to the MPEG. And if it doesn't understand MPEG, it'll try AUG. And if it doesn't try AUG, it'll use WebM. If it doesn't understand WebM, it'll fail back to Flash video. And if it doesn't support Flash, you can even put a block of code in here saying, I don't know what kind of video your browser would even use. <laughs> but this format right here, with the embedded Flash player in the middle of it, is supported across 100 browsers on the planet, 100% of all browsers. This video format, you will have to provide multiple formats of the video. And this will change over time. Over time, the browsers will provide cross-support and do those kinds of things. But in the meantime, you can provide alternates, and your browser will pluck out the one that it supports. YouTube. If you go to YouTube slash HTML5, you can begin experimenting with the new video tags. What's interesting is YouTube historically has served up Flash content to all the desktop providers. And Flash is just fine. I'm not a Flash hater. I'm not, I don't have anything bad to say about it. But Flash was not native to the browser. You had to have a plugin in order to support it. Now, the fact that that plugin was installed across 99.5% of all browsers made it feel like it was ubiquitous and made it feel like it was the standard. But in fact, that support was dependent on the presence of the Flash plugin. You know that Apple and Adobe have been fighting over Flash support, and these devices don't support Flash, and yet we can still view YouTube video on these things, right? YouTube has gone in and transcoded all their videos, so they provide Flash to those who can use it. They serve up HTML5 and PEG4 videos to these things. So this is not a big deal. This is something that all the major organizations are well aware of and will continue to support. It'll be nice if there was one true video format to rule them all. But in the meantime, we have very simple workarounds to make sure everyone can have a similar video viewing experience in their browser. Yeah? I was only able to scratch the surface 
I've given you a lot of websites to go and look at. Dive into HTML5.org is a wonderful website. That's the book. I gave you HTML5 Doctor, like the MD, taking your temperature, making sure that your HTML5 is there. Lots of good tutorials and workarounds there. I gave you HTML5 Rocks. Dot com for tutorials and things. Here's another one, html5demos.com, where you can go and begin seeing some of these things. Video objects, canvas, which we didn't talk about, geolocation, which we didn't have a chance to talk about. There's only so much we can pack into one presentation, but there's so many more exciting things out here. Hopefully, not only have you seen what we can do here, but we've given you enough resources that you can go out and begin learning more, and all these resources are free and for the taking. And I'll leave you with this thought once again. This is a new era in web development. HTML is not SGML. HTML is not XML. HTML is HTML. And we are no longer going to program to the slowest animal in the herd. We are going to program to the most powerful animal in the herd because that is what advances state of the art. And if you have slower, weaker animals in the herd, we will use polyfills to go in, polymorphically backfill that behavior so that they too can participate in the new HTML5 revolution. This is what we discussed today. Remember above all else though, that we're in an era now where the elements mean something. We have semantics, and this opens up a whole new world. And I hope to see you this afternoon when I start talking about microformats and RDFA, because this is just a glimpse into what we can begin doing when our websites can be not only human-readable, but machine-readable as well. But for right now, the HTML5 revolution is right here. Did you enjoy yourself? I did. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs>